This is a GCSE physics paper from SIA. It's Unit 2, Higher, and we're taking the paper from June 2014. And we're going to do an exam walkthrough for this entire paper. So let's get started. Question 1. Part A. Mobile phones involve receiving and transmitting waves which some people think might be harmful to health. All new mobile phones in the UK must be tested and given an SAR, specific absorption rating. The SAR value is a measure of the energy absorbed by the head while a mobile phone is being used. The table gives the SAR value for adults for three different mobile phones. To be sold in the UK, a mobile phone must have a SAR value lower than 2.0 watts per kilogram. So here we have mobile phone X, Y and Z with SAR values of 0 0.15, 0 0.85 and 1.85. Question then comes and says give two reasons why there might be a significant risk to very young children of using mobile phone Z. Well firstly we can see that it has the biggest SAR rating. So if this is very close to the legal limit for adults, it's very likely to be over the limit for children. The other thing to think about, for example, is the fact that in a child, uh, everything is still developing. You know, it hasn't, it hasn't finished growing, it hasn't finished uh, developing um, organs and stuff like that so you're very likely to be more susceptible to damage during the developmental stages um, compared to an adult who supposedly everything has already developed in those uh, individuals so children are going to be more susceptible uh, for example they would have thinner skulls and so therefore the um, radiation may penetrate more so there's if it's at the legal limit for an adult then it's going to be probably above the limit for children and children are going to be more susceptible to the influences and have more at risk because of the developmental things that are going on. Okay. Other than keeping the length of the call as short as possible, what precaution might a user of a mobile phone take to minimize risk of absorbing too much radiation? Okay, so you could use, for example, Bluetooth connection uh, or you could use just a cabled um, headphone uh, system that would have a microphone on it so you could take calls over um, the phone without having to worry about holding it to your head. So basically any method that allows you to get the phone away from your head while you're taking calls will be the what they're looking for here. Part B. Complete the table below to show what happens when light waves are refracted as they travel from air into glass. So it's important for us to think firstly about the fact that they're traveling from a faster medium into a medium that we would regard as having a lower speed of light. So they're slowing down. Okay. Um, the one thing to remember about frequency is that um, across a boundary it stays constant. So waves hitting the front of the boundary are also leaving the back of the boundary. So waves arriving at the boundary equal waves leaving the boundary. So frequency is constant but because this is slowing down speed will decrease and wavelength will have to decrease as well. So it stays the same for frequency, decreases for wavelength and decreases for speed. Part C then, seismic or earthquake waves travel through the earth to the surface. When they arrive, uh, when they arrive there, sorry, they cause buildings on the surface to vibrate. One type of seismic wave called an S wave causes buildings on the surface to vibrate parallel to the earth's surface. Seismic waves are either longitudinal or transverse. What type of wave is a seismic S wave? So this is straight book work. We've got a wave direction like this and we've got a vibration direction that's perpendicular and so that is straight book work. The definition of a transverse wave is one 
where the vibration direction is at 90 degrees to the wave direction, so it's transverse. Part C, explain the reason for your answer to part C1. So what you have to do here is explain that a transverse wave has a vibration which is at 90 degrees or at right angles to the direction of wave motion. So the wave is traveling at 90 degrees to the vibration direction. Okay. An S wave has a speed of 3.5 kilometers per second in the Earth's crust and its frequency is 1.3 hertz. Calculate its wavelength. So this is straight use of the wave equation. So we'll say that V is equal to F lambda. We're wanting lambda, so lambda equals V over F. So they're wanting a wavelength in meters, so we should really um, take a bit of time to write V in meters per second, and it's going to be uh, 3,500. Okay, so V over F is going to be 3,500 divided by 1.3. And I'm getting 2,692 meters for that. The vibrations caused by earthquake waves are detected by a seismometer. The graph produced is called a seismograph. The full scale diagram below shows a seismograph. Using the ruler shown in the diagram, measure the horizontal distance between the peaks X and Y. And each one centimeter on the scale represents a time of about 0.8 seconds. Convert your measured distance to a time and use your answer to calculate the frequency of the seismic wave in the region XY. Remember the region XY shows two complete waves. So I'm going to want to measure from X here. Let's make this a bit smaller. From the edge of X which you can see there is at about 4.2 and up as far as the edge of Y okay now we're talking about the left hand side of this here and the right hand side of this here and to me that's going from 4.2 up to 5.9 so we have two complete waves so two wave periods is based on this gap between 5.9 and we subtract from that 4.2 which means 2t on this diagram is represented by 1.7 centimeters. Now we're told down here that each centimeter is 0.8 so we can say that 2t equals 1.7 times 0.8 and that will now be in seconds so t is going to equal uh, 1.7 times 0.8 divided by the 2. Now if t equals that value then f equals 1 over t so f will just be that expression upside down. So f is just going to be 2 over 1.7 times 0.8 and that gives a frequency of uh, 1.47 hertz. Part D then, the longer you sunbathe, the more ultraviolet radiation your skin receives. Sunscreen lotions absorb some of the radiation 
and the lotions are given a skin protection factor SPF number. The graph shows how the amount of radiation received by a person's skin is related to how long they are outside on a sunny day. If the skin will get sunburn if it receives 50 units of solar radiation. So we have this graph telling us and we have to watch out for 50 units. So we've got one for not having any sunscreen on, one for SPF 15 on, and one for if you're wearing SPF 30. So the question then says, how much longer can you stay in the sunshine if you use a lotion with SPF 30 rather than SPF 15? So we're looking at how long you can stay uh, out before you get sunburn. So they've explained that you get sunburn at 50 units, so at this top line. So they're asking how much longer do you get with this than with this? Well it's the length of this. We get 50 units with SPF 15 at 150 minutes there and we can go all the way to 300 minutes with SPF 30. So the answer is going to be 300, the value we get 50 here, take away the value of uh, how long it would take us to get 50 units at SPF 15. So it's 300 minus 150 is our answer. And so it's going to be 150 minutes. For those who use sunscreen lotions, the length of time they can stay in the sun before they get sunburn is directly proportional to the SPF factor of the sunscreen lotion used. By considering the relationship between the SPF factor and the maximum time spent in the sun, calculate what minimum SPF factor is required for someone who wants to stay in the sun for two hours without getting sunburn. So what you're going to do here is go to the graph and you go to two hours on the graph Let's see if we can bring it back here. So let's just move this a little bit. And we'll drop in our graph. Just so that we can refer to it without hopping back and forward between the pages. So what we want to uh, recognize here is the proportionality. At SPF 30, you can stay out for 300 minutes to get your full dose without sunburn. At SPF 15, you can stay out for 150 minutes. So the amount of minutes you can stay out for is a linear relationship. Um, that basically there's a number, a constant here, that relates the SPF to the amount of minutes you can stay out. And it's clearly going to be 10. It's 10 times SPF 30 lets you stay out for 300 minutes. 10 times SPF 15 lets you stay out for 150 minutes. So your time here is equal to some number times your SPF. So when we do this um, for like 300 minutes equals K times SPF 30, you can see that K equals 10. So the time you can stay out is going to be 10 times your SPF and you can see that that works for 150 as well. So if we're expected to stay out now for two hours, we have that 120 equals 10 times our SPF. So our SPF is 120 over 10. So we need SPF 12 to stay out for two hours.
Question 2, Part A. A camera is used to take a picture of a tall object. The image is formed on the light-sensitive surface of the camera. Give three properties of the image on the light-sensitive surface. So they say it's uh, we're taking a picture of a tall object. You know, you could be taking a picture of something very tiny with the camera, but they say specifically that we're taking a picture of a tall object. Now the image that turns up on the light-sensitive surface will clearly be much smaller than that of the object because it's much further away from the lens than the image would be. The image is sort of here, tall object there. We're going to get it also, since a ray will come through the optical center here, the image will be upside down. So we've got an inverted image, we've got uh, a diminished image because it's smaller than the object. And we've also got a real image because it will actually meet at the film here. So we're talking real, inverted and diminished. So that's what we want to be saying here. Okay. Part 2 then says, on the full scale diagram below, draw two rays using a ruler from the top of the object to show where the image is formed on the light sensitive surface. Remember to put arrows on your rays to show the direction in which the light is traveling and mark clearly the image. So we're getting quite a bit of uh, marks here. There's like four marks for this. You also have to make a measurement afterwards. So being accurate is important because there's six marks altogether going for this and we should really make sure we are doing our absolute best to make it accurate. Now, there are two rays that we normally draw for this kind of um, behavior. We have a ray that's running parallel to the axis and it turns and goes through the focal point. But we don't know the focal point here. We can, however, start with the other ray that goes through the optical center and passes straight on. So we need that one first. If this is in focus, then the second parallel ray must land at the same location. So identifying where they focus to on the film is our first port of call here. So what we want is a ray running through the optical center of the lens coming from some point over on this side and going through that optical center need to be able to move it around as well so um, I'm going to try and line this up find it very difficult to see where it is with my fingers on the iPad but somewhere neatly from the top through the optical center of the lens arriving at the screen is what we want to end up with like that so that is light coming away from the uh, object and heading for the film here. Now another ray coming along parallel to the axis will turn and also arrive here. So we want to add that ray as well. So I'm going to put in a second ray which is heading at first parallel to the axis and again I'll just change the color of that there this needs to also head um, until it reaches the center of the lens or the line marking the center of the lens what it will do then is turn and go down and meet the first ray at the film so it will follow along something like that just put some arrows on to indicate way the light's heading and so we've now identified here the point where it crosses which is like the focal length and our job is now to measure this focal length because the focal point is where this ray crosses the axis we know they meet here because it's a focused image. So this point must be the focal point and therefore this distance must be the focal length.
And according to the mark scheme, if you measure this correctly, you should get 25 millimeters. And they're allowing plus or minus one millimeter to get two marks. But if you're further out, you might only get one mark. Okay, so six relatively easy marks. They're drawing some rays, putting some arrows on, measuring a distance, and uh, six marks. Nice. Part B, when a ray of light is passed through a glass block, it is refracted. The diagram shows a ray of light passing through a glass block. The angle of deviation is the angle between the incident ray and the refracted ray. So what they're doing is they're saying, you know, this was the direction it was already heading. The refraction caused it to change and go this way. And we call this angle in between where it was heading and the way it ended up going the angle of deviation. As part of a physics lesson, Joanne used the setup above to measure the angle of deviation for a range of angles of incidence and the results she obtained are plotted on the grid below. So she found this was true about them. Now the first question about this says that um, as shown on the grid, Joanne drew a curve through the points. She then came to the conclusion that the angle of deviation, this thing, was proportional to the angle of incidence, this thing. Explain why this conclusion was wrong. Okay, so this is all about your knowledge of what proportionality represents. Okay, there's two things that are required for proportionality. First, we need a straight line. And secondly, we need a straight line that goes through the origin. So you need to explain that only a straight line through the origin indicates proportionality. If we were to double uh, the angle of incidence here, we wouldn't get a doubling of the angle of deviation. So it's quite clearly not a proportional system. Okay. So it's not proportional, it's not a straight line through the origin. Next part then says, using values taken from the graph for the angles of deviation when the angle of incidence was 20 degrees and 40 degrees, carry out two calculations that show that the angle of deviation is not proportional to the angle of incidence. So when we were at 20 degrees, <coughs> we get a D value, deviation value of like 5.5 uh, degrees. There should be a D, sorry. It doesn't look much like a D. And at then 40 degrees, we get a corresponding D value there of 18 degrees. So what has happened here is that we have doubled angle of incidence, but we definitely have not got a doubling of uh, the deviation angle. So you do calculation, you do calculation, or you measured off from the graph, sorry, you measured off from the graph, and then you calculate the ratio of these and the ratio of these and they're not equal and if it was proportional the ratio of these and the ratio of these would be equal so when we do that we find that the ratio of the angles of incidence is 2 and the ratio of the deviation angles is 3.3 so it's definitely not proportional Part C, describe in detail how you would measure experimentally the critical angle for glass using a semicircular glass block. You may complete the diagram to help your answer. And this is a very simple thing. Remember when we're at the critical angle, the angle of refraction as the light tries to leave the glass will be 90 degrees. This is why we use a semicircular block um, for the simple reason that we are going to send light in at some angle towards the center of the block so we need to know where the center of the block is we need to mark that and what we're hoping is that that will emerge along the edge here at night. so when we're at the critical angle to this normal in here then the light coming in will go out at 90 degrees so your explanation has to explain 
the whole idea of marking a normal on here at the center of the straight edge, firing some light in using a ray box that you've got here, and increasing this angle until we get this special case where the angle of refraction out here is 90 degrees. And when we achieve that, then we need to mark this light going in and measure then this angle so that we can get the critical angle. So you need to describe setting it up, uh, drawing it out on the page, marking the position of where we're sending the light towards, etc. And then increasing the angle going into the glass until we get this special case at the output of 90 degrees. Question 3 here we have a circuit for looking at the resistance of a length of wire using like a voltmeter ammeter kind of method. Pupil wishes to measure the resistance of a length of resistance wire. They are given the following incomplete circuit diagram. Uh, to help ensure reliable results, the pupil decides to take three sets of values for current and voltage for each length of wire. Use the correct circuit symbols to complete the above circuit to show a voltmeter, an ammeter and a variable resistor and how they should be connected. Okay, so voltmeter is going to be going in parallel. We've got the um, got the sample of wire here, so the voltmeter is definitely going to be in parallel with that. So that's going to be here. Um, and then either of the two remaining spaces will be the ammeter and the variable resistor. Okay, so just make one of them the ammeter and make one of them the variable resistor. And that's it, you've got a loop then where you can vary the current and as you vary the current this voltage will change and so you'll get a current and a voltage reading as you vary the variable resistor. So remember we're just uh, using basic rules an ammeter measures current and two components that are in series will have the same current so ammeters must go in series um, voltmeter has to go in parallel because two components in parallel have the same voltage across them and so that's the rule we're operating here and the variable resistor has to be in series so that it can alter the amount of current and consequently this voltage. So, says then, during the investigation the pupil only closes the switch when taking a set of readings. One reason for this for doing this is to help conserve the energy of the battery, but there is another important reason. State what other reason it is. Um, and I think what they're getting at here is the idea that the resistance wire will heat up, and if it heats up, that will affect its resistance. And so they're trying to take the results very quickly. It's not necessarily very good practice because the uh, voltage and the current will then be changing as the thing tries to warm up. So I'm not sure it's the best practice. The correct way to do this would be to use very low currents so that the wire is not significantly heating up. So you would explain that the uh, electricity flowing through the wire would make it heat up and the heat will affect its resistance and therefore alter the thing you're trying to measure. You could also mention about safety issues to do with the wire getting very hot and becoming dangerous. Something like that. The people used the circuit to measure the resistance of different lengths of wire of the same material. On axes below, draw the graph he would expect to get when he plotted his results. Well, remember that the resistance um, is rho L over A. Um, and so if the only thing we're changing is the length, we're keeping the other properties of the wire the same, then R is going to be proportional to L because rho and A will be constants, and that means we'll get a y equals mx type thing here, which will give us a straight line through the origin, because they'll be proportional. So, part 4 says, uh, an 80 centimeter length of this wire was found to have resistance of 12 ohms. Calculate the resistance then of 60 centimeters of the same wire. So we can say that R is rho L over A, and if we're keeping uh, everything constant, except for the length, then these two will form just a constant. So you could say that R equals some constant times the length 
and we want to find that constant using these first bits of information. So for a start we can get this k value because it's going to be r over l and for these numbers it's going to be 12 over 80 and that gives us a k of 0 0.15 and that's going to be in like ohms per centimeter and then we use that with the 60 centimeter of the new bit of wire so R still equals KL but we've got a, a new value of L so we fill those values in and we get 9 ohms Part 5. Calculate the resistance of a piece of this wire of length 120 centimeter an area of cross section half of that so we're messing now with both L and A so there's a very easy way of looking at this we're doubling L so there's a times 2 on the top line and we're halving A so there's a times a half on the bottom line so if we combine those we get times 2 over a half and so that is equivalent to R times 4 and so it's 4 times the value of the 60 centimeter piece of wire so we had 9 ohms and we're going to multiply that by 4 to get 36 ohms okay so the L doubled the area halved so overall the resistance has changed by a factor of 4 Part B then, the picture shows an electric toaster and the label attached to it and it says electric toaster 240 volts 960 watts. Using the information from the label as given above, calculate the current flowing in the toaster when it is in use. You are advised to show clearly how you get your answer. So we've been given a voltage here and a power. And, uh, current and voltage and power are all related by the electrical version of the power equation so that's really our starting point that power equals VI and therefore I is going to be P over V which in this case we can check was 960 over 240 which is 4 amps calculate the resistance of the wire used in the toaster well remember that we now know voltage current power we're interested in R and R can be got from either the power equation uh, using the original numbers like V squared over R or it can be got from Ohm's law that R would equal V over I so you can use either of these then I'm going to use the numbers that were presented in the original question that way we don't have to use the I that we calculated in case there's something wrong with it so 240 squared over 960 is giving me a value of 60 ohms and you can easily check that by doing the value using ohms law and the current that you got which you can see there is also giving 60 so this method gives 60 that method gives 60 so that's good agreement toaster shown in the picture which can take two slices of bread always has both toasting slots switched on when in use. This wastes electrical energy for a lot of people who wish to make only one slice of toast. The diagram below shows the basic circuit for the toaster. By rearranging the heating elements and adding additional switches it is possible to make the toaster to toast either one or two slices of bread as required. 
Complete the diagram to show how the circuit could be arranged. Now there are a ton of ways of redrawing this. Um, the mark scheme specifically mentions that you should be putting them in parallel to control them independently. Um, so I would have one that was on all the time and one that a switch position that then allowed you to uh, toast both sides so uh, or both both channels. So I would probably have one on all the time. Obviously it gets turned off when you turn the switch off. But then another one which represented the single double option. So you've got a switch and the other channel. So this switch would have two positions and one this position would say, you know, like toasting one channel only and closing it, the position for that would say toasting both channels and that would work. But there are other ways. Um, you could have easily just put a switch in here that shorted the first side. So when this switch was open you had the toast uh, the two channels the way they were and then you shorted this. You might think hold on that's changing the resistance um, and that might affect the way the the two sides behave but so is this and that's what they're asking you to draw so there are lots of ways of doing it part D we've got a little resistor network that we're trying to find the total resistance of it says find the value of the resistance between X and Y so um, the way I do these kind of questions is I always call this bit that we have to simplify give it a name and then we realize that what we have then is a 5 and a value over here that we're calling RP and so the R total will equal 5 plus RP and so we need to know the value of RP so we use the equation to find the value of RP 1 over RP is going to equal 1 over 2 add it to 1 over 3 and so we need to take a common denominator of 6 there. Uh, so a half is going to be, oh, sorry, 3, 6. And a third is going to be 2, 6. And so we get 1 over RP equal to 5, 6. Which means that RP is 6 over 5. And that's like 1.2 ohms. And that means that our total over here is 5 plus 1.2. And that comes to 6.2 ohms. Question 4a. Electrical signals can either be AC or DC. Uh, what is meant by the abbreviations AC and DC? So this is alternating current and direct current. Nice and straightforward there. Part B then. An electrical signal is connected to a CRO, cathode ray oscilloscope, and a student makes a sketch of the waveform obtained as shown. So we've got the scale of the CRO here, and we've got the uh, trace. How can you tell from the sketch that the electrical signal is AC? Well, if we assume that this has been properly centered, then we've got positive currents in this top half and negative currents in this bottom half, which tells us that the current is reversing direction. And that's what you need to explain. How can you tell from the sketch that the electrical signal has a constant frequency? And uh, that's done by recognizing uh, how long each uh, section is taking. You can see that there's three little ticks for this peak to come back, three little ticks, three little ticks and again and if you just explain that the period of each one of these cycles is a constant that tells us that the frequency is also constant so you, 
A full cycle takes the same amount of time in each successive wave. That's what you're explaining there. Part 3. Sketch below a graph to show what a student might see on the CRO screen if the voltage was a changing DC. So specifically DC, so it stays on one, one side, it's either all positive or all negative. But changing means that there's some kind of variation in it. Okay, so we say changing. So something that had positive value but was al altering, that's okay because it stayed positive. And what you find is this is the kind of output you get in DC power supplies and stuff like that because they're made from what starts off as an AC. And so, so long as there's a, an approximate average value of, say, 4 volts or whatever, then they can call that a 4 volt power supply. So, uh, real DC isn't flat like you would get for a battery. You know, a cell would just be a complete flat line. Um, but this shows that it's very Okay. Part C then, below is a sketch of a piece of apparatus which can be seen in some science museums. It consists of a star-shaped wheel made of copper which can rotate in the vertical plane with one point of the wheel dipping into a pool of salty water. A wire from the salty water to the cell completes the circuit. When the switch is closed, a current flows in the direction shown by the arrows. So this little sort of spur thing dips down into this uh, salty water and it forms a circuit. So basically there's a current down through here and that's coming through this magnetic field which is going across like that. So the questions are on the next page but I'll, I'll talk about them here because we need the diagram really. Um, it says uh, Describe and explain fully what would happen uh, when the switch is closed, what happens to this wheel. So this is a Fleming's left hand rule problem. We've got current going straight down. We've got magnetic field going across from north to south. So if you get your left hand and you point like a gun from north to south across the way and then you point your current finger, which is your sticking out second finger, down then you should find that your thumb is now pointing towards you. So if we point our pointy finger left to right and our current finger straight down, you should find that if you use your left hand for that, that your thumb is now pointing towards you, which means that the force on this thing will be that way, which means the rotation will be that way. So if we were to explain that the spur would rotate anti-clockwise from our perspective, that would get us the description marks. Now the explanation has to come from Fleming's left-hand rule. So we've got a current in a magnetic field, and so it experiences a force according to the left-hand rule. And that's what you need to explain, that if you use the left-hand rule on this, that spur will be pushed for, towards us, as we've shown there in the diagram, and that's why we'll get rotation. When the switch is closed, the variable resistor is adjusted so that the current flowing in the wheel is increased. Uh, what effect, if any, would this have on the wheel? Well, you're going to get a stronger force on the wheel, therefore you should get an increase in the speed of rotation. Then we're asked, well, the switch is opened and both magnets are now turned around so as to reverse the direction of the magnetic field. The switch is closed again. In what way, if at all, would the behaviour of the copper wheel be different to your answer in part one? And so we get a reversal of our magnetic field. The current's still down. We get a reversal of our magnetic field, which will give us a reversal of the push. So it should rotate the opposite way. So the direction of the rotation would reverse at that point. Part D then, transformers are used to reduce the 240 volt mains voltage to run electric fences on farms in Britain. One of the transformer coils has 480 turns and the other uh, coil has 160 turns. What is the number of turns on the primary and the secondary? So we need to recognise that we're trying to step down, okay, because we're doing a reducing of the voltage. 
So the higher number of turns has to be on the primary coil, and that means that the 480 must be on the primary and the 160 on the secondary. That will give us a uh, reduction because remember that Vs at V at the secondary over V at the primary equals N at the secondary over N at the primary. So if we want the secondary to be smaller, we need the number of turns on the secondary to be smaller. And it says then calculate the output voltage of this transformer. So we need to think about our transformer turns ratio equation. And so if we just want the voltage at the secondary on its own, we just multiply through by VP to get a new expression, and then we just fill that in with the numbers we already have. So we had... Um, 160 turns at the secondary, 480 turns at the primary, and we had 240 volts going into it, and so that should give us the output voltage. So if we fill in those numbers, we get a voltage at the secondary equal to 80 volts, so that's our output voltage. 5A. The photograph below shows a nebula. It's believed that our solar system was formed from a nebula and the bright spots are stars. Describe what a nebula consists of and explain the stages that a nebula goes through as it forms a star. So we need to explain that we start off with a humongous cloud of gas which is mostly hydrogen and dust particles and so that then uh, starts to shrink in under its own gravity and that causes uh, the centre to warm up considerably and more material will gather at the centre and the compression of this under gravity will cause the temperatures to go way way up and what happens then when you get to very high temperature is that you start get, uh, getting the hydrogen nuclei banging together hard enough to form uh, new nuclei and that's when we get the uh, nuclear fusion starting at the centre and that is the beginning of a star. So something that outlines those details. Part B and one, the Big Bang model for the formation and evolution of the universe involves a number of stages. These are described in the numbered statements be shown below. Place the stages in order in which physicists believe they occurred. Write your answers in the boxes provided. So you've got four things and you have to put them in order of like earliest up to the most recent. So what have we got? Neutrons and protons formed, further expansion and cooling allowing hydrogen nuclei to form. Well that can't happen until you've got neutrons and protons. Further expansion and cooling allowing electrons to combine with neutrons and protons to form atoms. Uh, rapid expansion and cooling of the universe. So you can see the two of them talk about further expansion, further expansion. So rapid expansion and cooling is going to be the first thing here. And you can't really have two or three until you've had one. So one has to go next because neutrons and protons are needed to have hydrogen nuclei. And that's going to be our next one, hydrogen nuclei. And finally, the idea of atoms forming. Okay, so four, one, two, three. Rapid expansion, further expansion um, is coming later, but after the rapid expansion we get the first particles being formed, neutrons and protons coming. We can't have um, nuclei until we have nucleons, and then later we can't have atoms until we have nuclei. So that's sort of how we sort out the order of it. Part 2 then, what is cosmic back microwave background radiation? So this is a radiation that we find in all directions uh, in space in the microwave re region. So it doesn't matter which uh, direction you point your 
detector, you find this microwave signal coming from all directions in space. And part three then is what is the origin of the cosmic background radiation? And remember, this is the the leftover cooling of the flash of the original Big Bang. So when the Big Bang went off, there was a massive amount of heat, and that has cooled and cooled and cooled until we now get this signal, which is in the microwave region. So it's a leftover from the original explosion. And that's why we see it in all directions. Gravity has played and continues to play an important part in the universe. Describe the three, three of the roles that gravity plays in shaping the universe. Okay, so you can think of things like, uh, for example, formation of uh, solar systems. So the idea of gas clouds com uh, condensing in on themselves and... Uh, that idea, you can talk about planets orbiting and uh, stars orbiting the galactic centre in each galaxy. So you can think about the formation of planet systems or the formation of galaxies. Um, there's other things like, like for example, um, whether or not a planet has an atmosphere it depends on the strength of gravity it can have. So those kinds of things. Part D then, several ideas have been put forward about the final fate of the universe. For each one listed below, give a brief description of what might happen to the universe. So we've got uh, big freeze, big crunch, big bounce. So, um, this is all to do with whether or not there's enough gravity to pull the universe back. If you think about throwing a stone up in the air, um, it gets further and further out when you throw it harder. But there is a velocity you can throw a stone up and it will go away from the earth and never come back. And so a big freeze represents that. All the matter expands, but doesn't have enough gravity to pull itself back. And so it just keeps on expanding and the universe becomes, the matter in it becomes more and more separated and over a very long period of time, all the stars will eventually burn out, and it will get very cold then. So, something along those lines. Big crunch is the opposite of that. There is enough gravity, and it will eventually fall back in on itself. And we will get a big crunch when it goes back to being extremely small, like it was in the past. Okay, something along those lines for the big crunch. Now the big bounce is like the big crunch, only the thought there is that the collapse causes another big bang. Okay, so it's very like the big crunch, only when it reaches the sort of singularity point, it then has a new big bang after that. Question 6. The Earth is divided into layers. These layers have different properties and compositions. On the diagram below, label each of the layers marked by the arrows and write the name in the box provided. So this is just straight book work from your notes. We've got crust, mantle, outer core and inner core. Crust, mantle, outer core, inner core. Okay then. Name the layer or layers which are solid. And again, that's just straight book work. The crust definitely solid, the inner core is solid, and parts of the mantle are solid. Iron is one of the two main elements that are present in layer four. Name the other, and that's nickel. Again, this is all book work. And uh, layer one and the upper part of layer two are collectively known as the lithosphere. Again, straight out your notes. Part B, one cause of earthquakes is explosive volcanic eruptions. The other cause is associated with tectonic activity. Explain what tectonic activity is and how it produces earthquakes. So this is, you need to talk here about um, the plates on the surface of the earth moving and 
when they jutter past each other, um, jolting and whatever kind of vibrations they produce against each other, that travels out as earthquakes. Okay, something to talk about the plates moving, something to talk about the moving against each other, and sudden movements then are what we can see as earthquakes. Part C then, most volcanoes are also produced as a result of tectonic activity. Diagram shows what happens, and here we've got a diagram of subduction with material um, under the sea being pushed under uh, a plate. So we've got a plate here and this other plate subducting under it. And there's tremendous amounts of heat produced here, and that then produces pressure, which forces material out of the earth. So what energy is required to form magma shown in the diagram and what is the source of this energy? So this is a little flashback to the energy topic. So the, you've got two objects moving past each other. Um, to make magma, to, to melt rock essentially, you need tremendous amounts of heat and this is coming from the friction between the two plates that are subducting and rubbing past each other. And that is that. And it's just a reminder that we do have a little app on uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Xbox 360 Indie Games. So if you've got a 360 and a gold account, you can download this and test yourself with lots of little questions that check your remembering of equations and basic facts in physics. So if you're at the stage of trying to finish your GCSE, this would be a good opportunity for you to test yourself and see what you know and what you don't know. Okay, thanks for watching.